Okay, so uh, we were looking at the process of medic meditation and um, why we are looking at these Hebrew words Haga and Siak is uh, because meditation was practiced in the Old Testament. So how do we, when we are looking at these Old Testament scriptures, uh, which are talking about medita meditating on God's word or meditation in general, um, how do we understand that? So we are looking at how did the Jews practice meditation. Uh, so those two words are descriptive of how the Jews practiced meditation. Um, it would uh, normally be where they would uh, softly uh, kind of repeat the words, whatever they were meditating on. So if they're saying a prayer or they are uh, repeating a passage from scripture, uh, the Hebrew scriptures, of course, they would say it softly and they would normally rock back and forth. So it is this uh, process of just uh, repeating, repeating, repeating. And in the process of repeating, uh, you're bringing your mind to focus on that word that you are uh, saying. OK? and um, We'll uh, just look at this definition that's here on the slide. Uh, so in usually in English, when we talk about meditation, it's usually just something that we're doing with our mind, right? So uh, uh, one way is to empty your mind, uh, to come to a place of complete uh, openness to receive anything uh, that may come to you. That, but it's always usually thought to be just a process that is uh, related to our thoughts or related to our mind. Um, but here, when we're looking at a scriptural use of meditation, it is also the use of your mouth. So you quietly repeat uh, in a soft droning tone. Um, so the intention of repeating is to remove all outside distractions and to begin to focus only on that word that you are repeating. Um, so if it is a Bible verse, if it's a verse, specific verse that you've taken, to constantly be repeating that verse. And as you're repeating that verse, your mind starts to focus on it. And you're also saying it you're able to hear it right with your ears so it's this process of speaking hearing and focusing our thoughts on that single phrase or that single um single uh, passage or verse from scripture um so uh, in this is uh, something that comes from a jewish prayer called davening where <coughs> texts were recited or, or prayers were prayed, and uh, th this is what I was saying, where they rock back and forth, and they are repeating a prayer, or they're repeating a text from scripture uh, in a soft tones. You're not saying it very loudly. It's just for you to hear, and for you to kind of uh, focus on and confess upon your own life. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so is this something anyone has practiced? Has anyone? tried meditating in this way? Or have you already heard about it? No, I see uh, Del had messaged earlier, uh, and Gertrude is thinking about scripture meditation, the art of thinking on God's word. Right. OK, thank you. So um, this is something that I will encourage us uh, to do, especially as we're going through this class. And um, I'll ask you all to share about your experience on what you're um, learning, what you have taken away from uh, this practice of meditation. OK. Um, so for us to understand what the process is. So when uh, I'll, I'll probably assign something for us to do where we are meditating on a passage, you can pick the passage. But understand what the process involves. So when you're meditating, you're thinking about that passage. You're repeating it uh, softly and uh, repeating it a few times. Now, the amount of time you spend on it is up to you. Uh, but the idea is 
that you're focusing on that passage. Uh, you're speaking the word, uh, and you're also hearing it. And uh, the idea is in that process that that word gets sown into your heart uh, and takes root in your heart. Uh, so this is how we look at God's word, the process of meditating on God's word. It begins in our spirit. So um, <clears throat> as we are meditating on God's word, it is a spiritual thing that we are doing. Um, and from our spirit, it is affecting our soul. So when we're talking about the soul, we are saying it's affecting the way we think. Um, it's affecting our imagination. It's affecting our feelings and it's affecting our will, right? So the soul is uh, the place where we uh, make our decisions, uh, the place where we um, view how we view the world, how we react to the world, how we respond to the world, how do we interpret things that are happening around us. Uh, so the way we think, the way we imagine, the things we desire, uh, the way we make decisions, all of those things um, are happening in the soul. So we want what's happening in our spirit as we meditate to impact what happens in our soul. And then we want to see that impact our physical bodies. That means the way we live our lives. Uh, so we want it to impact the physical aspect. So from the inner man to the soul to the body, uh, that's the process of meditation and the impact we want it to have. Uh, so there are three parts that we're going to look at in meditation. Uh, there's contemplation, visualization, and confession. We look at each of those and what that means. Uh, but when we're talking about meditating on God's word, uh, we may be doing any of these things. We might be contemplating the word, we might be visualizing the word, or we might be confessing the word. Uh, we can be doing that simultaneously. We can be doing only one of them. We can be doing them in order. Uh, whatever it is, these are the three aspects of meditation. Okay, so uh, we'll start with contemplation, then we look at visualization, and then confession. <laughs> So contemplation is what uh, uh, you had uh, mentioned, right? Can you tell me your name again? Sorry. Sagar. OK. So uh, Sagar had mentioned when he meditates on God's word, he's thinking about a specific passage in scripture. So that's what contemplation is, where you're thinking about a specific verse, and you're really going deep into what is this verse talking about uh, what uh, what does it say about God what does it say about me uh, how should it change how I live what are some things I can do in my present day uh, in the way I'm living what should I do to let this word actually uh, be the way I'm living um, are there any hindrances in my life that will keep this word from uh, being being fruitful or uh, keep me from living in obedience to this word. Uh, so those are some things that we will look at. Um, someone can read Psalm 143.5 for us, please. I remember the days of old. I meditate on all your works. I muse on the work of your hands. Thank you. So uh, this is uh, when we see here, I meditate on all works and I muse, right? That was the word that was used. And in um, the New Living Translation, it says, I think about what you have done. So this is where it's a mental exercise, where we're using our mind uh, to ponder on whatever we are meditating on. So we're meditating on God's word, we're pondering on that. Uh, that verse or that passage. Uh, let's use Isaiah 53, 4 and 5. We can open that. Can I read it, sister? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Surely. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, 
he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed thank you so let's just spend a few minutes we are going to be practice this um we may not um we can spend some time individually just looking at these words and thinking about what is this talking about okay and then we'll share what um, any insights that you have as you've thought about it we'll uh, i'll just give you say two or three minutes and um, you can just think about what are these two verses isaiah 53 4 and 5 talking about and we'll share uh, anything that we've learned. So any, um, any things you want to share as you were looking at those two verses? Any things that you noticed? It is like a prophecy that is like being foretold of what uh, he referring to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So what he would be, you know, it's like an exchange of what, uh, what we deserve. He's taken up on himself. Mm -hmm. And uh, it also refers to as though we consider it as though he's punished by God. Mm. But it was in the other way around that, you know, he was punished for our transgressions. Mm. He was, you know, for our guilt and our uh, iniquities that we have uh, committed. Okay. Yeah. So on, on what he's done, because of which we are healed and we are made whole. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, a few important things that uh, predicting what would happen, what Jesus would do. Uh, talking about how we perceived it but what was really happening and then talking about the end result of that the end result is us being made whole and us uh, being healed um any anyone else want to share anything Okay, so um, some things that we want to do as we are contemplating God's word is we want to look at what is the meaning of what is being said, right? So uh, what are the words that are being used? Uh, he, here 
and now obviously we all have our different translations so the english words being used are different but um i'm just going to read from my translation so it's saying um he took my weakness he took my sorrows uh and then at the end it's saying um i am whole i am healed uh, because of uh, what he has done uh, and then it also says uh, he took my sickness uh, right so what is the meaning of that and that he's taken my weaknesses he's taken my sorrows he's taken my sickness what is the significance of it uh, meaning what is the uh, impact that that has on my life uh, if if jesus has taken all these things what does that mean for my life uh, what uh, how can i expect that to change um, the way i am living or the way i look at certain circumstances if i'm in a difficult situation and i feel uh, that i am too small for that situation um how can this verse change the way i respond in that situation uh, where i put my trust in jesus rather than in my own strength or in my own power my own ability to do something um so we look at the application of the verse uh, and we allow it to transform the way we think and the way we live right so that is this process of contemplation uh, we are thinking deeply about that specific verse or that specific passage we're thinking about what does it mean uh what does the word itself mean and then what does it mean for my life how does it impact my life how should i be living in obedience to this word um so uh, we'll just look at some of these verses that we've quoted here second peter 121 if someone can read that for us Uh, we'll start with verse twenty. So, Second Peter, verse one, verses twenty and twenty-one. Second uh, Peter, chapter one, verse twenty and twenty-one. Verse twenty-one. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Thank you. So, um, the word uh, that's used here. Uh, in the greek is pharaoh and that means they were born along or they were carried uh, by the holy spirit they were moved by the holy spirit to write the things that they wrote um so when we look at the scriptures uh, whatever is written there is not something that the holy spirit just uh kind of forced the writers to write the holy spirit moved them moved their hearts uh, moved their spirits to communicate a certain message but it was the human writers who actually wrote those messages right so even in this process of meditation uh we are looking at the holy spirit moving us in our spirits moving us in our hearts in the things of god uh so that uh it is a process where the holy spirit is uh inspiring certain things in us and we are responding to that inspiration it's not something that is forced upon us neither is it something that we ourselves are trying to do by our own thinking by our own imagination uh right so the holy spirit is the one who's teaching us who's guiding us uh through this process inspiring us um inviting us to new revelations of god opening our eyes to new truths and then we can respond to those truths so it's still left up to us to receive that or to discard it or to continue our lives in a way that uh we choose we can choose to uh, submit to that word or we can choose to walk in uh rebellion we can choose to continue to live the way we are living um so there is uh aspect of the holy spirit and us together in this process of meditation um can somebody read john 16 12 to 15 please john chapter 16 was 12 i still have many things to say to you 
but you cannot bear them now. Verse 13. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Verse 14. He will glorify me, for he will take off what is mine and declare it to you. Verse 15. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take off mine and declare it to you. So we see here Jesus talking to the disciples and he's saying, um, there's many things that I want to teach you, but uh, now is not the time, right? Uh, it's too much for you to understand. It's too much for you uh, to receive at this point of time. So the Holy Spirit will come and give you that understanding, give you that revelation uh, at a later time. So this is... Uh, we take this passage and we see that the Holy Spirit continues to be the teacher, uh, continues to be our teacher as we look at God's word, that the Holy Spirit will continue to reveal things of God to us. Uh, so um, he uh, He will tell you everything, he re whatever he receives from me, um, everything that the Father, belo Father uh, belongs to the Father is mine. So the Holy Spirit is revealing the things of God, is revealing the mind, the heart of the Father um, and the Son to us. Okay, so that's what we're doing in this process of meditation. Um, and then let's just look at uh, these three last three verses, Ephesians 4.23. Ephesians 4.23. Your heart and mind must be made completely new. Okay, so Ephesians 4, 23 is talking about the renewing of our um, mind, renewing uh, of our thoughts, renewing of our attitudes. And uh, Romans 12, 2. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, and do not be confirmed, sorry, confirmed to this word, but to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable in perfect will of God. Okay, so here again, it's uh, changing the way we think, um, but through that process of changing the way we think, we are able to discern between right and wrong, right? We know what God's will is. And when we know God's will, then we are able to say, this is not what God wants. So this is, uh, this is evil and what God wants is good. So we are able to discern that between what is good and what is evil or what is pleasing to God and what is not pleasing to God. Uh, and then Hebrews 5.14, Hebrews 5.14, but solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Okay, so this verse also talks about that discerning between right and wrong. Um, so that is what uh, meditation does, right? It will transform the way we think. It will reveal to us the will of God and it will help us in the decisions we are making, um, in the small decisions and the big decisions to be able to discern this is the will of God and this is not the will of God. So this is right, this is wrong. This is uh, pleasing to God, this is not pleasing to God. Uh, so it is transforming our thinking and transforming the way we live as well. So the first uh, part of um, meditation that we looked at was contemplation. And now we're going to <laughs> look at visualization. <clears throat> so uh, visualization is to see something with our mind's eye, right? So not with our physical eyes, but with our imagination. Now, um, we see 
imagination being used a lot in the world through uh, media, through advertising, where people are calling you to imagine a better life for yourself, right? When someone is trying to sell you something, uh, in an advertisement, they are showing you something uh, that is very attractive and they want to kind of grasp your uh, desires, your imagination for your own life and they want to say, this is the life you should have, right? Uh, so that is what actually we should be doing with scripture instead. Right, so we don't do that enough with scripture, where we're allowing God's word to capture our imagination, where we start to desire to see God's word fulfilled, uh, God's word have or uh, bear fruit in our lives in the ways that God wants to uh, do things in our lives. So what does God want to accomplish in our lives? How should our lives be transformed so that our, our lives align with what God desires for our life. Um, so we look at these uh, examples that we have here, Genesis 15, 1 to 6. Can I read, sister? Yes, please. Uh, Genesis 15, 1 to 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying do not be afraid abraham i am your shield your exceedingly great reward but abraham said lord god what will you give me seeing i go childless and the heir of my house is eliezer of damascus then abraham said to uh, look you have given me no offspring indeed one born in my house is my heir and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now towards heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Thank you. And uh, Genesis 22, 17, please. Genesis 22, 17. Blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. M multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. Thank you. So um, you see in Genesis 15 uh, this is the uh, this is after God has called Abraham to leave his father's house and he's told him, I'm going to make you a blessing to the nation. So Abraham has left and he's come away. He's not yet had Ishmael. Uh, and God uh, comes to him and tells him that you are going to have descendants as many as the stars. God just doesn't say those words, right? He asks him to look up and look at this has this picture of uh he has an image in his mind and his promise that he receives is based on that image uh, so god is using that picture to help abraham imagine a new future a future that he's not yet seeing uh at present because he doesn't have any descendants at all uh right and so in genesis 22 17 this is after abraham takes ishmael uh takes isaac sorry to uh to give him up as a sacrifice to god and then god stops him and reiterates the same promise right so i'm going to make your descendants as uh, numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand in the seashore so uh the use of that language that uh using of those pictures is to help him visualize something uh that god is promising him that he uh maybe 
God could say, I can give you a thousand children. I'll give you 10,000 children. But God is using these kinds of pictures to say that they won't be, they'll be beyond your ability to number them. And those pictures capture um, Abraham's imagination, right? His imagination for his future, his picture of his future. Um, <clears throat> Let's look at Numbers 13, 30 to 33. Numbers 13, uh, verse 30. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great st uh, stature. There we saw giants. The descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we, like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So uh, this is an example of uh, two groups of people who experienced the same thing, but because of the way their imagination worked, or we, the way they saw their, uh, saw their reality, uh, they responded to that experience in different ways. Right, so we see in Numbers 13, Joshua and Caleb, uh, and the, the 10 other spies. So the 12 spies are going out to explore uh, the land of Canaan, and God has already promised to give them that land, right? So in Joshua and Caleb's mind, they have pictured victory. They have pictured that they are going to take this land because God has promised it to them. Uh, but the other 10 spies, uh, they are looking at something that is real, right? The people there were giants, but uh, they have pictured themselves as grasshoppers in comparison to those giants. Are they really physically grasshoppers? No, right? But that is the imagination that they had. That is the way they saw themselves. Uh, whereas Joshua and Caleb could see themselves as people who are able to fight this battle because of God who is on their side. Uh, so that's where we look at how is scripture, how is uh, the word of God impacting our the way we look at things, the way we imagine ourselves in response to certain situations that we are facing. So we allow the word of God to capture our imagination, to, um, to uh, tell us the way we should think, uh, the way we should uh, picture ourselves, so that when we go into a situation, we are responding in a way that is in line with God's promises. Right? Uh, so just because of this one incident, the whole future of that generation of Israelites is impacted. That like they all miss out on receiving that promise that God had for them, that blessing that God had for them. Uh, and so our imaginations can have a huge part in how we receive what God wants to give us and how uh, we are able to fully experience the blessings uh, that God has already promised to us. OK, so um, we'll just look at these uh, few verses that are listed here, and then we'll continue. Deuteronomy 11.18. <clears throat> Therefore, you shall lay up these, my words, in your hearts and in your being, and bind them up for a sign upon your hands, and as forehead hand bands between your eyes. Thank you. And Deuteronomy 6, 8. And you shall bind them up as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Uh, Exodus 13, 9. 9 and 16.
it shall be as a sign to you upon your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the lord may be in your mouth and for with a strong hand the lord has brought you out of egypt 16 and it shall be as a reminder upon your hand or as a frontlet between your eyes for by a strong hand the lord brought us out of egypt thank you and the last passage proverbs 4 20 and 21a uh, i'll read sister yes please. my son give attention to my words incline your ear to my sayings do not let them depart from your eyes keep them in the minds of your heart Thank you. So um, we saw in those first few passages, uh, the first few verses, Deuteronomy and Exodus, uh, a physical act, right? So uh, God was saying, don't forget this law that I'm giving you. Don't forget these instructions. Uh, do these physical things to help you remember. So tie it on your hands, tie it on your forehead, between your eyes. And these were things that the Jews actually uh, were practicing. So what was the idea? Was it just to have some outward symbols of God's word? Or what do you all think was the idea behind it? So that you will know how close you need to hold them up to. How close you need to hold the word up to whatever the law and the thing that's in, how close. Yeah, so to keep it always close to you. Significantly important. As as important, okay. To meditate on it, sister. To meditate on it, okay. Yes, so uh, for, okay, and Lucy shared to help in reciting. So um, what what they would do is they would write it and it would be tied up, right, on their hands, on their forehead. The idea was you are constantly reminding yourself of God's word. And it's always uh, something that is impacting the decisions that you're making. So uh, it's on your hands. So every time you're doing something, you're reminded of God's word, right? You may not be able to read it, but you know what is written in those uh, verses. And so uh, you're reminded of that as you're doing things with your hands. But it's always also before your eyes. It affects the way you view things. Uh, so while that may be a physical act of tying it on your head, uh, the picture is to always allow your eyes to be um seeing through the word of god so your vision the way you look at the world the way you perceive the world around you is uh as per the word of god so the word of god informs how you are viewing the world around you how you are responding to the world around you how you are living your life daily okay so uh, that is that is where we're talking about this thing of imagination uh, it influences our perspective on the way we live our lives, on the way the world around us functions, um, is influenced by the word of God. Um, so we'll close with this last part on confession. Okay, so meditating on God's word, we talked about contemplation, we talked about visualization, and this last part is confession, that is saying what God has said. Uh, Joshua 1, 8, which we read earlier, it says, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, right? Meditate on it day and night. So there's meditation on it. Uh, and there's also this process of speaking that's included. Uh, it should not depart from your mouth. You should constantly be confessing the word of God. Um, and we see in that Old Testament, uh, when we were talking about those two words of meditation, that in that meditation, they were actually speaking the word of God. Uh, in the New Testament, we don't hear so much about meditation. We hear about confession. Uh, so uh, what does confession mean? 
the Greek word is homologio, to speak the same thing, to assent, to accord, to agree with. So we are saying that we are coming into agreement with the word of God. We are speaking the same thing as God speaks. We are agreeing with what he says, and we are, are coming into alignment with God's will for our lives. So when we are confessing God's word, what we are saying is, I am coming into agreement with your promises. I'm coming into agreement with what you have said. And I'm speaking that same thing over my life. OK, uh, we'll just read Romans 10, 17. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Thank you. So uh, when we are speaking the word, we are also hearing the word. And so uh, this is that process of increasing our level of faith. Uh, when we are saying we meditate on God's word and we are constantly repeating that passage that we're meditating on, we are also hearing that as we are repeating it, we are also hearing it. So we are allowing the word to not only be on our lips, but also to receive it through our ears, receive it into our heart. And so in that process, we are growing in faith. We are allowing that word to be implanted in our hearts, uh, to take root in our hearts. Uh, we are allowing ourselves to begin to believe that word, to take hold of that word for ourselves and for our own lives. Um, so we'll uh, end with this. Uh, so what are the three things on meditation, the three Contemplation, visualization, and confession. Yeah. So contemplation, thinking, visualization, seeing, and uh, confession, speaking. OK? Uh, so those are the three parts of meditation. Uh, we'll close here. Does anyone want to share anything, ask any questions? You're all good. OK, let's uh, take a break. And we'll come back for um, the next class on New Testament survey at 11. Thank you.